typical Colombian looking hair greased back, you know, long. And, and you refer to this guy as the boss in your book. The boss. He's the and boss. And is this the same guy you dealt with every time you went every to Colombia? Every time I went to Colombia. Oh, yeah. Did he ever get popped or did he no, ever get busted? No, never. never. He actually, you know, we, of course, you know, throughout the years, we all lost contact with one another. Right. This shit went down. I didn't want to run into anybody. Right. I, even some of the guys that where I grew up with, we, you know, kind of, mm. or you had to actually, because when you're an ex con, you can't hang around with ex cons, you know, mm-hmm. or you violate mm-hmm. some fucking mm-hmm. shit. But, um, um, yeah, we uh, <clears throat> we didn't remain friends, but we were we were good friends while that was while that was all going on. He actually, um, if you remember, uh, of course you know the story Blow, right? The movie. Well, there's a scene in the movie where he, where George and Diego, Carlos Slater, take their money to Panama and put it in a Panama bank. Mm-hmm. And he makes the, George makes the comment about, wow, I give you $30 million and you give me this little book back, you know, and they take off. So later on when he wants to get out, um, um, Diego uh, starts working on Norman's K in the Bahamas on that island. Right. That island is actually called Norman's K and it actually does exist. Okay. And it was used exactly for that because Carlos later used it for that, who Diego was supposed to be in the movie. Right. So, story goes on, George decides to get the fuck out of the business and all this kind of shit, and he goes back down to Panama to get his money, and the guy says, we well, should have called, he said, the president of the bank says, you probably should have called because um, your, uh, your money has been appropriated by the, the government of Panama. Two years prior to that, three years prior to that or so, my guy in Colombia told me when I, was, I did a mm-hmm. job for Noriega, I told you this, mm-hmm. I, I didn't know who it was for. The guy wanted 60,000 pounds, and I'm like, I'm going to fuck who this. As long as Carlito and Leo bring me the money, I don't meet anybody. Right. I right. don't need to know anybody but you guys. I <clears throat> give you, you pay me, and this kind of shit. Right, exactly. So they wanted 60,000 pounds, and at that time, I could do 60,000 pounds, but I had to go to the boat twice because mm-hmm. I couldn't get it all in once. I didn't have enough boats to work to go you know, at that time to get it all in one shot. So mm-hmm. I was going to do this very serendipitously, serendipitously with, uh, with the same boat. So we get 60 pounds. I said, give me a, you know, show me the boat. What's it look like? Give me a schematic. Let me show you how you're going to load this fucking thing. You know, because if you're yeah. going to sit out there all night long, you can't just have the shit laying everywhere. Right. You know, especially if I approach it and leave it. I mean, that, now, now you're wide open. Mm-hmm. So... I find uh, I find that in the drawings of this is this vessel in the uh, 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 front of the vessel is called the forecastle, mm. and in front of the forecastle is a is a maintenance bilge, maintenance hatch mm-hmm. that, that you get to in maintenance bilge, just big enough to put thirty thousand pounds of shit in, mm. you know, but there's a maintenance hatch, the maintenance closet you go through to get to the hatch to get down to the bilge room, mm-hmm. you know, to check whatever that needs to be checked, and those are all watertight drawers doors because they're going to the bilge of the boat right then i said don't press your bales any bigger than you can get through that hatch put thirty thousand pounds of it put half of it down there shut that hatch <clears throat> and if you've ever been aboard a boat uh, a vessel or any kind of seagoing giant ship mm-hmm. where they have watertight doors or where they don't have watertight doors they have a threshold that you have to step over right you step through and into the room yep. the threshold is usually 14 16 inches tall mm-hmm. Well, when you close the hatch to the bilge down below, it only stuck four inches above the, the, the floor. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the best bongs in the business. With Freeze Pipe's freezable glycerin coils, you will enjoy colder, bigger hits without the throat burning or intense coughing. Check out Freeze Pipe's entire line of unique pipes, bubblers, bongs, and dab rigs at thefreezepipe.com and use the code CONCRETE to save 10% off your first order. That's thefreezepipe.com and use the code K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E. I said, put half the load down there shut that hatch and the maintenance hatch wasn't any bigger than you know twice the size of your table here Mm -hmm. the room itself right i said put five inches of concrete in there on that floor and cover that fucking thing up and they'll never know it's there and put your brooms and your buckets and your shit and your eggs and throw them all back in there huh so when i come the first night you get the first thirty thousand pounds in the main is, is in the main midship hold i'll get that the first night you put that on deck i come and get it when I call you the next night, you jackhammer that hole open, 
take that other 30,000 out and get it ready to go and I'll take it then. So I get the first 30,000 and we're headed back in. We're about two hours into our trip and I get a frantic call from the captain of that boat, dude. And he's talking about, send your chase boat back. He says the a plane looked like the Marine Patrol or was somebody, a Coast Guard just flew over the boat. He said, no, send you send your boat back for us. And I said, you know what? Fuck you, dude. I said, how in the hell do we don't know? How do we know that they don't know we're out here? You know, right, right. that's my getaway. I, that's, you know, I paid for that fucker, not you. Right, right. You know, this is the game we play, dude. That's pretty much what I said to him. I said, you know, hey, you know, this is a game you play. Right. And whether or not something would happen, whether it did or it didn't, it's just the way it is. Right. Well, as it turns out, the next day we're unloading, they were sending this shit to Miami, getting ready, you know, mm-hmm. keyed up for the next night. Turns out that they went out and boarded the vessel. He has the four cents to call back to Panama then saying we're being boarded. Panamanian, the Panamanian uh, registered vessel. So they reported hijacked at sea, out of the, out of out of Panama. Okay. The um, when they boarded the vessel, there was residue from the first thirty thousand pounds of shit that was in there. Right. From in the main ship hold. Right. So they confiscate the vessel. They arrest the the crew and the captain and shit, and they tow the vessel into here into the into Tampa. Into Tampa. Right. They held the boat for four months. For evidence, they couldn't keep the vessel because it was a Panamanian registry and it was a stolen, it was a hijacked vessel. Right. Well, because of all the residue and shit that was in the first hold of the boat, they never knew the other 30,000 pounds was still in there. Under the concrete. <laughs> Under the concrete. They deported the boat back to, to um, Panama. Noriega put another crew on it. So <laughs> no it fucking <laughs> way, man. That's so crazy. Oh, man, it was just like, you know, and, and at that time, it didn't seem like anything to me. It just seemed like, wow, what a stroke of luck that was. And right. that's, that's when um, Jorge, George, shows back up with this handwritten note from Noriega mm-hmm. to me in Spanish. And all it said was, uh, it says, uh, I said, holy shit, my friend, how in the fuck did you do that? <laughs> All it said, and I, you know, and I wish I'd have kept that thing, man, because it's you know be worth it. Oh my god, could you imagine? And ironically enough, then when I was busted in '87 or '88, '88 it was. Um, this was just, they were just coming to the end of Operation. Um, um, oh, what the hell was it? Oh, it'll it'll it'll, um, it'll come to me. But when they when they got Noriega, mm. they captured Noriega and they brought him to the United States. They put him in Miami MCC, Metropolitan Correctional. That's where I was. Oh, really? <laughs> they put him in the same fucking place I was. But we never knew one another. But they put him in the seg, you know, where you're... Se- the what? Um, Segregated? Segregation. Okay. Um, and um, it's a whole different you know, yard that you can get into and stuff like that. But we could see each other through the fences. You, you knew, knew what he looked like? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Who didn't know what Noriega looked yeah, like, man? It's a pot marked face and shit just right. a short fucking guy you right. know it's a piece of shit you know right. really nobody i ever wanted to deal with right. but i didn't have to deal with him directly right i'll take his goddamn money for, oh, sure. for sure yeah but um yeah that was kind of ironic we wind up in the same place together at that at that time but he wound up doing he finished his time here in in america about five years ago and he was um extradited to france where he'll he'll probably die in prison in france oh he's in prison right now in france oh yeah oh wow yeah but that's my little run in with that wow, too. <laughs> man. Fucking crazy.